Yankees lead it by five here at the top of the sixth inning. When in New York, stay at one of the nine Manhattan East Suite hotels where you can get a spacious suite for price. For the price of an ordinary hotel room, you can call 1-800-M-E-S-U-I-T-E. -E. And when you call, that's for a couple of guys that are really take good care of you. Tom Chamberlain and also Mark Hurwitz. New pitcher, TJ, the third of the game for the Bosox. Sox. Rich Garces originally signed by the Minnesota Twins, and a, I think it was the Minnesota Vikings that signed him. 1-0, 318 ERA, 17 innings pitched. Walked about uh, four and a half uh, runners per nine innings. 15 strikeouts. Rich Garces at one time was one of the better pitchers that the Twins had in their organization. He was, they were really high on him. O'Neill leads it off here in the sixth. He is 0 for 3. Off the glove of the second baseman out of the center field. So that should be scored a base hit. Merloni going to his right and has to backhand the ball and catches it about ankle high and then Number kicks it out of his glove. The center fielder, Bernie Williams. Ten hits now for the Yankees in this game. That'll bring up Bernie Williams. Well, on a beautiful afternoon, I think it's the same weather that we have here in Boston as they have back in New York. And I would suspect that probably a few people out uh, you know, grilling some hamburgers and some hot dogs and enjoying the game and enjoying the, the uh, beautiful sunshine. Beautiful holiday weekend. They got a long weekend. Probably some guys in their golf carts that are driving around playing golf that have the television sets on and tuned in to the WB 11. Maybe one under par at this particular time through 12 or 13 holes. And there's some sunshine out here and obviously uh, it's tan time. Hopefully they have some sunscreen on. The place to be on those sunny days is uh, right back up underneath that scoreboard. Nice shade. Close to, to the concession stands. Up high for a ball. Now it's one and two. Right up underneath there. Look at that. Right. Unobstructed view. Unless the fly ball goes up. Maybe we might do an opening. Uh, we, we could tape an opening from out there sometime. We? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Bernie. He slaps it the opposite way for a base hit. So the first two men are on for the Yankees here in the sixth. And that will bring up Strawberry. Garces throws a high fastball. Obviously, you want the ball down. But Garces got it high, and that just lets the batter level on the ball. See Birdie hitting with a firm front side out over the plate, drove the ball to left field. They will put the shift on again for Strawberry on a, in a double play situation. But they can't move the third baseman over as far as they want to, as they did with nobody on, because if that's the case, the runner on, uh, it, it would be a foot race between O'Neill and Ballantin, and who's going to get the third base. So he's got to stay someplace He's got to stay someplace close towards third. Now the shortstop is going to move back on to the other side of the second base side. You've got to do something the, to hold the runner on, yeah. And it's 0-2. You know, one of the things that they used to do, uh, they won't let you do it anymore, is you could shift around out there, move while the pitcher's throwing, and uh, they took that out because they said it was distracting to the hitter. They'll throw back to second, not in time. In one of the old Dodger Giant uh, 
rivalries. Eddie Stanky was in back of second base taking it calisthenics to try to distract the hitter. You mean uh, taking jumping jacks? You know, jumping you jacks jumping and all that stuff yeah. out there. Uh, Sound like they do at a professional basketball game. Like when they wave the Behind, little... Yeah. Uh, the, the gold. Yeah. That's, uh, but they said that uh, you can't do that anymore. Once you're in the position and the pitcher goes to pitch, you have to stay at that position. Now it's two and two. Nobody out for the Yanks here in the sixth. Good hitting count right here. When the pitcher was ahead one and two, that was his pitch. Now two and two, you've, you've got to throw your pitch because you don't want the count go three two. You want something to happen right here. And it's up high, and it will go to three and two. The runners will hold. Chop towards Movad at first at his only play. There's a step on the bag, but meanwhile, the runners will move up to second and third. Well, Daryl Strawberry doesn't get a sacrifice, but essentially that's what he did. He moved the runners from first and second to second and third. He would like to have had a little better swing. But the Yankees last uh, inning had Brocious on third base and uh, Knobloch up with one out. He flew out shallow to left field now with runners on second and third. They're going to walk Posada and get the Chad Curtis. Well, Posada was the guy that they pitched to in the fourth inning when they intentionally walked Strawberry. So now he gets the free pass so that they can load the bases up and pitch to Curtis. Well, he knows about pitching. He spent uh, several years, six years, with the Atlanta Braves as Bobby Cox's third base coach. <laughs> and I would suspect that the Braves have some pretty good pitching down there. <laughs> if you had to classify in your day, TJ, uh, uh, four starters like the Braves have been throwing out there for several years, the Smokeses, the Glavins, the Maddoxes, uh, who would you pick that had the four starters like that? Um, well, we had a pretty good staff uh, with the Dodgers. Uh, Andy Messersmith, Don Sutton, uh, Claude Osteen, Al Downing, myself. Uh, it's hard to get four starters. Usually you can get two good ones or three good ones, but it's hard to get four. And the ball gets away from Veritek. O'Neill will come on and score the ninth run for the Yankees. Williams moves to third and Posada to second. It may have been a miss sign by Garces because Veritek didn't really. Uh, and it got he John didn't play Hirschbeck. That, one very well. that ball got John Hirschbeck. Veritek was looking for something on the outside part of the plate, and that was a fork ball or a fast ball that Veritek didn't put any leather on, and it got uh, it got Hirschbeck. It looked like on the inside of his left leg. He doesn't even put leather on it, and that gets him right on the looks like on the thigh or, in, or the inside of the thigh. Well, those umpires uh, like the catchers. They take a beating, and they've got padding, you know, all up and down uh, the front side, and somehow that ball always seems to find some flesh or some bone. You know, if I was David Wells, on my way out, I would just go up to John on the way out and say, John, uh, are you okay? Yeah, did it hurt your right arm? No, good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you worked those umpires over pretty good. I mean, you stayed uh, you stayed buddies with those guys. And I guess that's a pretty good play. I mean, uh, they are as much a part of a game when you pitch as anybody. 
If you don't have them on your side, uh, oh, man, I'd can... rather have them on your side than against you, obviously. If, if they get it in for you, they can either, as a batter, widen that strike zone out or as a pitcher, squeeze it down. Two balls and a strike to Curtis with Williams down at third. There used to be an old umpire named Ed Hurley. And when you came in the league, he would test young pitchers out. Would call a pitch right down the middle of the plate, a ball, and just see how you reacted on the mound. And if you were reacted positively, he would be a good umpire. If not, you couldn't throw the ball in a cigar box, and it would be a... Rich Garza is having a tough time throwing the ball down, and I think one of the reasons he has a hard time throwing the ball down, he can't get over his stomach. And when you can't get over your front leg, it's tough to throw the ball low. Outside, ball four. The bases will be loaded once again. And the pitching coach, Joe Kerrigan, on his way to the mound. Joe Kerrigan give us words of wisdom. Joe Kerrigan, the pitching coach with uh, Montreal for quite a few years. Worked under a pretty good manager up there, Bobby. Felipe Alou. Yeah. Felipe, a solid player in his own day, and uh, what a job he has done with the rotating superstars of Montreal. Number 18, the third baseman, Scott i tell you this, uh, going back to your, um, there's Pedro Martinez. You know, you were talking about, was there four pitchers? Yes, the Baltimore four pitchers, McNally, Palmer, Cuellar, and Pat Dobson. All won 20 games in one year. Well, Brochus is perfect for the day. He is three for three with an RBI double. Like for an, uh, Brochus like to be four for four right here, do some damage, maybe hit the ball in the gap. Brochus makes uh, Garza throw at least one strike. So it's one and one. I would just totally disregard his breaking ball because I don't think he can throw his breaking ball over the plate enough times to get you out. And if he throws it, you spit on it and look for his fastball. And that would be the breaking ball that you wouldn't even pay attention to. And Brochus goes a little bit too far and it's strike two, one and two. Ball inside. So far with the bases loaded for Brochus, he's perfect. Gonna go fast ball in again, I believe, here. And it's high. And now the count is three and two. Nobody warming up for Jimmy Williams in the Red Sox. He's going to drop a breaking ball on him here, 3-2. Oh, boy, if he does. <laughs> now that's the only pitch that he's gotten close to the plate. And the breaking ball up high, ball four, and Garces will walk a run in. Yankees lead it 10-3. He hasn't come close to throwing a strike with his fastball, and his breaking ball was the only thing close to coming to the plate, and that was a wish pitch. He wished it over the plate instead of throwing it and uh, left it high. I think uh, when Joe Kerrigan came out to talk to Garces, he, he carried a, a big 25-pound ball and chain, and it staked right to the mound because he's going to be out there. Sometimes in games, a pitcher, one pitcher, has to take the brunt of the infliction because you've got to save your bullpen. And there's a game tomorrow, and you, you don't want to go through five or six pitchers in a 10-3 to three ball game. And that's why sometimes you look in the paper and you see one pitcher gives up eight or nine runs. You say, how can they do it? 
just like this. One ball, one strike to Swain, who's the ninth place batter. Swain 0 for 3. Posada at third. Curtis down at second. Dan Brocious on at first. So Ducks on the pond. And it's two and one. I heard that term someplace, ducks on the pond. <laughs> Thought I'd use it here. <laughs> During these kind of games, you kind of bring out everything that you have, you know. Inside, ball three, three and one. That's about all I have, so if you've got anything, Tommy, just throw it in there. Well, you know, the, the cliches that you got to throw out in games like this on the on the bench. Was that a cliche? Uh, just a little. 3-1 pitch popped up with a broken bat. Infield fly rule is called, and there's two gone. Boy, Dale just 3-1 did not get a real good uh, swing, a kind of a long swing. And he got jammed and popped the ball up. This is a right here you could blow the game wide open. And, and when you got the team down and you've, you've got this ball club struggling, you've got them reeling, well, you go for the knockout punch. You get the base hit, a double right here, and, and, and you just take it to them and take the wind out of their sails. Well, knockout Knobloch is up right now. He hit a grand slam back in the second, so he's got a chance for two grand slams in this game. Tie himself with Tony Cloninger. Two home runs in one ball game. One of very, very few ball players have two home run, uh, two grand slams, I mean, in one ball game. And TC, the uh, bullpen coach for the Yankees. That's uh, a 1 1 pitch. Very unlikely. What a trivia question that is, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> two grand slams for the Yankees in uniform. In uniform, that's right. Chuck. Narciss appears that he is just trying to aim the ball now and throw a strike whenever he. So he, he just he just out there wishing. Uh, like I said, he he wished that curve ball and and that is he just throwing the ball and and a breaking ball outside ball three three and one. There's Tony Cloninger. Pretty good pitcher in his day, yes, too, Bobby. I'm telling he you. He could get her up there. <laughs> he was a pitcher, but he ended up hitting uh, two grand slams in one game. Just got underneath it. High fly ball. Center field. The wind got a hold of it, but Lewis is there. So Garces gives up a couple of runs here in the sixth for the Yanks. Bottom of the six coming up, they lead it by seven. This copyrighted telecast is authorized under rights granted by the New York Yankees solely for the private, non-commercial use of our audience. Any publications, reproductions, retransmissions, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of the New York Yankees and WPIX is prohibited. Yanks in front, 10 to 3 here in the bottom of the sixth inning. Mo Vaughn leads it off for the Bo Sox. Mo, uh, eighth on the uh, Boston Red Sox all time home run list. Number seven is Rico Petroselli. We were talking about him, Rico, with 210. First pitch inside and low to Vaughn. So you think Vaughn will end up in Baltimore, huh? Well, if Pal he's going, is gone and no, if he's going to leave here, I, I think Baltimore is a uh, is a good choice. He hits well in that ballpark, but then if you're alive, you can hit well in that ballpark. I think the Red Sox will sign him. I think the Red Sox should sign him. Yeah, because I would hate to see he's an he is an, an institution here. Of all the players, Boston teams have had uh, Patriots, Celtics, Red Sox. He is probably 
civically and civic minded does more for this city and is um, and and is accepted by the city more than any other ball player he does a lot for the kids and he's a uh, a, a, a Boston fixture and you should try to keep people like that if you can out of Seton Hall and also from Norwalk Connecticut he went to Seton Hall huh? with Cerrone well, I don't know if he, well, he didn't go with Cerrone no, he, he's much younger than Rick yeah. oh yeah Bo would have been good with that aluminum bat too oh Down low, ball three, three and two. Had knee surgery last year, along with his little uh, tirade with Dan Duquette, general manager. Whoops, he missed another one in our ball guy down the right field line. That was a tough play, though. I'm not going to. No, we I don't can't. say much about that one. Red Sox have three errors already. You, you don't want the ball guys to start getting there. Dan Duquette sitting there. Maybe he was on the phone a little earlier. Maybe he was with uh, going to his banker, trying to get a loan to uh, sign Mo Vaughn. But speaking of Mo Vaughn, going to Seton Hall, he was a teammate. John Valentin was a teammate of his at Seton Hall. The Pirates have put out some pretty good players. And another foul off to the right side. Where you talk about teammates, about Darren Bragg. Georgia Tech. I know it. Garcia Parra. Veritech, Veritech. the teammate of uh, Glenn Bragg. You know, Veritech. Darren Bragg, I mean. Veritech was a high school third baseman. Uh, never caught. Went to Georgia Tech, and uh, we'd like for you to catch. The, he learned how to catch in college, and a pretty good move by Jim Morris, coach of the Ramblin' Rex. Popped him up left side. Glasses down, and... Groshef out into shallow left field. One gone. Mo Vaughn has that uppercut swing, but you can see he really, when you throw the ball outside, he really likes to get inside and drive the ball to left field. That's why he, he is tough in this ballpark, because if you pitch him in, he can pull the ball, but if you pitch him away, he just takes it off that left field wall, and You've got to be kind of lucky to pitch to him outside. That or you got to have a good fastball. The eight, Jim Lairitz steps down with one out. Well, you know, when you have that uppercut swing and if your timing is off at all, your bat is slow through the strike zone and most of the time you'll have to hit the ball to left field. Uh, Jim Rice, the hitting instructor for the Red Sox, wants Mo to use his hands more. Mo, use your hands more. They did it again. I can't believe they it. They did it again. I cannot believe it. John Sterling, uh, there's Jim Rice there. We're talking about that foul ball that came back up towards the uh, booth up here. Michael Kay and John ducking out of the way of the foul ball. Nobody went for the ball. Michael just sat there. The ball just kind of he just frozen. There they are. Yep. Just a minute ago, yes, uh, John was showing what he did. Now it's two and two. <laughs> yeah, oh, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're just to the uh, side of us here on the press level. That'll scatter some Yankees on the left side. I don't know about you, TJ, but when those foul balls uh, come our way, I'm I'm getting out of the way of it. I'm not a hero anymore. I'm not going to challenge him. I didn't challenge him on the mound. Why would I do it here? That's I don't true. have a glove. <laughs> right now, it is very quiet here at Fenway. The Yankees lead it 10 to three. Right down Broadway, and Larritz has struck out for the second time in the game. Strikeout 
number five for Wells, and there's two gone. Jim Leyritz shaking his head. No, that's not a strike. Jim, that was a strike. Now, I know you don't think it was. My heavens. He's looking there. No, there's no way. It's not low. It's not inside. It's not outside. <laughs> it's a strike. Troy O'Leary takes one uh, low for a ball. I think a hitter a lot of times thinking and looking for a fastball, and then when you throw a, a different pitch, they don't see it quite as well, and they don't think it's a strike. O'Leary, one for two. Hit hard, but Jeter is there to snag it. And the Red Sox are gone here at, in the sixth inning. Six have been played. Yankees lead it by seven. And for up-to-the-minute scores and highlights, plus your complete WB11 Yankee broadcast schedule, check out Sal Marciano's scoreboard on the WB11's website. Visit the www.wb11.com. Well, David Wells, TJ, 90 pitches, cruising right along. Two more innings. Two more innings would get him into uh, the eighth inning, and you can turn it over to maybe Willie Banks. And Jeter leads it off here in the seventh inning for the Yankees. 10-3, they lead it. He pitched um, 120 innings in the perfect game, but uh, really, people make a big thing out of pitch counts anymore. If you're in shape, you should be able to throw 125, 130 pitches. That's lined down the left field line. Fan reaches out for a ground rule double. Lead off double by Jeter. Second hit for Jeter in the game. And Jose will lighten the load over at first base. Good extension by Derek Jeter right there. And you see a little fan interference here. Ball bounces up, and the fan reaches over, catches the ball. The umpire clasps his hands over his head, and that means fan interference. Maybe they had given O'Neill a base hit his last time up when he hit the ball hard. They e forward uh, They finally Marloni. they yep. changed it to an error on the second baseman. So he's 0 for 4. Hall is not going to like that. He said, I gotta put up with John Hirschbeck and a tough score. Yeah. <laughs> And it's a bright, sunny day. <laughs> and now it's one ball, two strikes on O'Neill. So the thing about this Yankee ball club, every game, it's somebody else comes to the, rises to the occasion. Well, hit out into the left center field. Lewis on the warning track. Jeter will tag and go to third. So even though the Yankees are in front by seven, leading at 10 to three, the Yankees still hustling on a base pass. Yes, it is. Paul O'Neill, that little leg kick. And he just kind of, you see him kind of look down and toss the bat. He knew that he got just underneath it enough. He didn't really center the bat and the ball. Paul has that little leg kick that, uh, of his front leg unique to him, but it's his timing mechanism. Infield will come in with Jeter down at third and only one out. Bernie two for four this afternoon. One of the things I believe that uh, you've got to look for right here you lost a ball game last night, five to four, in a game that you were up four to nothing. And 
like I said, when you get a ball club down, you want to pound them. If, if you can beat them 15 to 3, you just want to let these guys know, hey, you may have won the game last night, but we're better than you. And now, you know, you, you, you aren't out there bunting and, and, and stealing and things like that, but you're just keep pounding the ball, keep pounding the ball, moving runners over. Try to get the ball. Just to let those guys know, okay, you won, but we're better than you are. Chopper moves on at first base, getting up high. So the runner holds at third, and the two gone. Tell you, for Moe's big size, he makes some pretty athletic plays once in a while. Now, a lot of ball clubs will go on contact, and uh, the old Cardinals, Whitey Herzog Cardinals, with Lankford and uh, Ozzie Smith and Okendo and guys like that would go, as soon as that ball hits the ground, they're off towards home. And Mo Vaughn had to jump. Mo might have gotten net on that one. So Strawberry will try to knock in Jeter at third. The shift is on once again. Nice stop by Veritek. And Jeter can get a huge lead down at third base because he doesn't have to worry who's going to get him. The shortstop over, I mean, the third baseman's over where the shortstop would be playing. A pull hitter, a left-handed pull hitter, and uh, Derek can get down 30 feet down the line if he wants to. I think that would really affect if there's a if there's a wild pitch or a passed ball. Jeter can get down so far that if the ball gets just a few feet away from Baratek, Jeter essentially could almost walk home. Way out in front. And now it's two and two. Yeah, they used to tell the third base runner, you get off as far, far as, as the, the third, third baseman. baseman is off. So Jeter's home, so come on in. <laughs> It's three and two. Now you see where the third baseman is. Jeter could get off even more than that. Why, why do you want to stay back with the base? Just come on down because who's going to get you? And really, as wild as Garces is and as uh, Veritek has, has shown that uh, he could mishandle balls back of home plate. Man, I would get down there a whole lot farther, Bob. And I don't think that if Jeter, if he came down three quarters of the way of the plate, Garces could catch him if he tried to go back to third or try to race him back to third. Well, Jeter could if he had buffet written on him. Another chopper fouled off the right side. Come on, Jose, get down. Yes, sir. He, Look at that. Jose he, got well, down there two, two, two times What now. happened, though, he had lightened his load up because uh, when the runner got on, he... He, he gave some things back to the runner, so he's not as heavy as he normally is at first base with gloves and, and uh, shin guards and things like that. Hit down the right field line and smoke. It's in for at least a single. Jeter comes on to score. And another fan interference and a ground rule double. The Yankees lead it 11 to 3. Whoops, watch out. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Darren Bragg went over and that lady was trying her best but she doesn't come up with it that ball was smoked and now this is fan interference now they don't have to give Daryl Strawberry two bases you see that young lady right there trying to get that ball she almost fell out right on her head and they reeled her in like a fish they asked the fans not to reach over and interfere with the ball that's in play. I don't know if it's just instincts or what when fans are along the lines there that they have to stick their hands out. Posada, who has walked a couple of times, intentionally walked in the sixth. So that makes three walks. He scored and picked up an RBI. But on that play there, the umpires could have given Daryl Strawberry any base they wanted. They, they could have given him third base if they thought that he could have gotten a triple on the ball. It's, uh, it's not an automatic double. It's where they think you would be if the fan did not interfere with the ball. And they pointed to John Hirschbeck pointed to second base.
And usually it's the home plate umpire, our second, uh, third base umpire that's watching the play because Richie Garcia, the first base umpire, is out trying to see if there's interference involved. Breaking ball in for a call strike, so Posada's gone. The Yankees pick up another here in the seventh. They lead it 11 to 3. Bottom of the seventh, Yankees 11, Boston 3. Let's take a look at some of our out-of-town scores brought to you by Nissan. 7-2, Toronto leads it over Cleveland. I think uh, Mike Stanley's hit a couple of home runs in that game. That's in the seventh. Colorado leading Cincinnati 3-1. Most of the games being played tonight. But right now it's a blowout with David Wells pitching for the Yankees and trying for his sixth win in a row. Romero Mendoza, who started last night, and Luis Soho uh, keeping each other entertained in this uh, seven to three lead by the uh, eleven to three lead by the Yanks. There are two fans in the blacked out area and that was why uh, John Hirschbeck went to both uh, the managers to say that they aren't going to start the game until they get those guys out of there. So they're gone and the game will start here in the bottom of the seventh inning. David Wells 91 pitches on that one there left it down the right field line and over is O'Neill and did he hang on to it he did. Good play by O'Neill, who was getting close to the wall. And there's one gone. John Valentin can't believe it. He thought at least he would come up for the base hit. And Paul O'Neill made a sliding catch. That's the only way you could make a catch right there unless you want to be a, a splatter mark on that wall because you're charging as hard as you can. And, and you, you can't pull up that that too quickly and still catch the ball. The only way is you, you make the slide. Paul O'Neill did it. Mike Benjamin steps in, and the only way that you can actually make an attempt to catch a ball like that is to have 11 to 3 lead. Because that ball gets by O'Neill. If he doesn't put leather on it, it's either in the stands or it's rolling around in right field. It's probably an inside the park home run. No balls, two strikes. There's that old scoreboard. It's still uh, handled by a human hand out there. Obviously, that hand will be attached to a human being. That's, that's going to be hot back in there, too, or do they have fans, or is, is it air-conditioned? I don't know. I, I've never been back in I there. I haven't either. I, I've gone over. You see where the camera is down by the ball, the, in between the ball and the strike? I've looked in that area before, but I couldn't see a whole lot. Inquis inquisitive person that I was when I played left field here at Fenway. Nobody ever invited me to come in and look around and utilize uh, putting up numbers talking about putting up some numbers <laughs> before his sixth win well hit in the center field that'll be a base hit for Benjamin now you see our camera is he going to pan inside the scoreboard there to give us a uh, inside look? Well, that's the look that is coming from the scoreboard camera. So that'd be the low-level left field view. That's what the left fielder is seeing. Hmm. Off the glove. 
Veritek will be thrown out by David Wells, and I don't know if that got some flesh or not, if it was just leather. He appears to be all right. Line drive, yes, it got leather. David got his glove up and kind of deflected it down. Good play by David Wells. And here comes uh, Gene Monahan and Joe Torrey. David knocks it down. Has presence of mind to pick it up and not rush his uh, throw. And I actually thought I saw a little smile on uh, David's lips after uh, he made the play. An old surfing uh, guy on the beaches of uh, Southern California. He, he's wiped out on waves tougher than that ball right there. <laughs> wow, did you see that? Wow. <laughs> now he knows how uh, Andy Pettifield, Graham Lloyd now will begin to throw in the Yankee bullpen. Mike Messina the other day was oh, hit man. by a line drive right in the in the forehead. Oh. Actually it caught him in the nose and broke his nose. Marloni. Marloni 0 for 2 this afternoon, two outs in the seventh. One man on for Boston. You know what that does, uh, throwing the beach balls and all that stuff out, it just gives David Wells a chance to compose himself. If he, if the adrenaline was pumping after that uh, line drive up the middle, it, it gives you a chance to calm yourself down and start making good pitches in the outside corner. Now it's one ball, two strike. Well, that, that ball was hit into the stands, and that was almost in the same spot. The last ball went in there and hit some lady in the nose and bloodied her nose. And that time a, a fan with a glove on fielded it. That was David Wells' 100th pitch. Side for a ball. Now it's two and two. You know, with this big lead, what uh, what Joe Torrey can do, Torrey uh, Wells gets out of this inning with let's say 103 or four pitches. He's going to pitch again Thursday against these same Red Sox. So you take him out now and, and you let him be good and strong for his next start. Now, if if the game were six to three or five to three. You let him pitch into the eighth or, uh, inning and then turn it over to the bullpen. Or turn it over to Rivera. Now with, uh, with an eight-run lead, you got 105 pitches or so. You let Graham Lloyd, because he's got to serve his three-day uh, starting Monday. Well, if you're looking towards that uh, Red Sox series, May the 28th, 29th, 30th, and 31st at the stadium. You can get your tickets at the stadium ticket window. Monday through Saturday, 9 to 5, and Ticketmaster, there's the phone number. And that probably will be a sellout all four days at the stadium. It should be. It should be. Jeter is short to throw out Maloney. Red Sox lead one man on. David Wells is cruising, and the Yankees lead it 11 to 3. Number 11 to 3 here at the top of the eighth inning as the Yankees come to the plate. And David Wells getting some handshakes in between innings. Only 102 pitches thrown. There's Mel Stoudemire over. That may be all for him. Do you think that's 
That's all for Wells. I I think it uh, I think it is um, because you've got a huge lead. You can uh, let Graham Lloyd get some work in because, like I said, he has to serve his three-game suspension, and he'll get some work. And uh, now you have a, a relatively rested David Wells coming Thursday against the Red Sox at the stadium. So Chad Curtis, who's two for three with an RBI. Well, you talk about the suspension. Daryl Strawberry was the first to serve his. Lying sharply in the left field for a base hit by Curtis. But the suspensions, uh, after two days, on a three-day suspension by Strawberry, he appeals the uh, third day. So he gets a chance to play last night, and tonight we'll see what happens tomorrow. Uh, they'll probably have a hearing tomorrow, and he'll, he'll take it when they're in the, against the White Sox. And you see what Chad Curtis does to a high fastball. It's called a rope. It's called a rope. And Brocious, who is uh, perfect so far, lifts one down the right field line, and it will curve foul. Brocious three for three. And Strawberry still has one more day left on the suspension. He, he could serve that tomorrow. Well, they have to have a hearing, I, th I think. Unless he waves it. Unless he waves it. He may be able to wave it. And then soon as uh, Strawberry is through with his suspension, the next in line is Lloyd with a two-day suspension, and then uh, Jeff Nelson after that. So there may be some strategy behind uh, serving the suspension and when the time frame is and when you appeal, etc. We'll just have to see how that plays out. Were you ever suspended, TJ? No. Brocious has gone on strikes. And Steve Avery now begins to warm up for the Red Sox. Well, there is a guy that uh, was on top of the world when he was with the Atlanta Braves and opted to uh, move on. And he just has hit on hard times. He started out with an injury. And then he changed his motion slightly, and now he's got to try to get it all back together. Dale Swain. Strike one to Swain. And Jimmy Williams, I believe it was last year, uh, Avery had a chance, so uh, had one start. If he starts it, uh, he gets a huge uh, salary kick in for this year. But he gets a renewed uh, contract. Uh, contract for a year. And Jimmy Williams started him, and there was no... Uh, there was no reason to start him because they weren't going any place other than he thought that he deserved to start. And I think the contract called for about uh, 4.4, 4.5 million dollars. So uh, that was a pretty hefty start. One ball, two strikes to swing, one out, one man on here in the eighth. For somebody that's not going to be a starter yeah. or an integral part of your team, but they're hoping that he can regain the form that made him a pretty good pitcher when he was about 19, 20 years old uh, with the Braves. Good pitch by Garces outside corner strike three, two gone. have left at least one man on in every inning so far in this game. They've scored 11. And now pinch hitting for Chuck Knobloch. Luis Soho will get some playing time. Dale Swain up there at the bat in the 11-3 game. You can't, you can't take anything close with two strikes on you. Block with a grand slam home run. He leaves with two hits and five plate appearances. Four RBIs, a run scored. And a foul back and out of play. Now it's 0 and 2 on Soho. Soho was hit in spring training by a pitcher and uh, broke his metacarpal on the left hand. And so he started the uh, 98 season on the disabled list. So 
So Joe Torre uh, giving Soho some playing time, which you very hard to do to keep everybody as sharp as you would like for them to be and take advantage of situations such as the one that we're in here now with 11 three leads. When you get a blowout either end, you're winning or you're losing. That's when you can get your bench players in, get them some at bats and keep them relatively sharp. And that's tough for both managers, Joe Torrey and Jimmy Williams. You want to give your starters as much playing time as you can, but uh, those guys on the bench, every once in a while, you've got a tough, tight game, and uh, you'd like for them to come in and pinch hit for you. That's tough if they haven't played in 25 days. Runner takes off, 3-2, and it's a pitch on the outside corner, one of those questionable pitches, so the Yankees are got here at the eighth, but they lead it by eight. And Graham Lloyd is the new pitcher. Graham Lloyd coming in, getting a chance to um, get some work in before he has to uh, go uh, serve his suspension. And it's a good time. You can come out there. You can freewheel. You've got eight runs. You don't have to be really perfect. Just got to throw strikes because I'm telling you, Hirschbeck has got right now, he's got a wide strike zone. He's in his 13th game, nine and two-thirds innings pitch. One walk. Graham Lloyd... A pretty good pitcher for what he does. Come in, get the left-handers out. And I'll tell you, he's not too bad against some right-handers. Yankees are 23-7 and seven when the starter goes six innings. Two balls and a strike to Darren Lewis. The leadoff man for the Red Sox. He's grounded out two times and flied out, so he's 0 for 3. 11 to 3, the Yankees lead it. Well hit, but right to Soho, who came in to bat for Knobloch. So Soho gets some action right off the bat here in the eighth. Absolutely. That's the way you want to do it. Guy comes in. He hasn't uh, played in a while, been on the bench for seven innings. Oh, what a, what a job he did for the Yanks last year. He's, he's got a good glove. Soho is so important, those types of players. They're versatile. You're going to have injuries. Uh, uh, to be able to put somebody in like that to, to do the job that they do. And Bragg takes the ball inside for a ball. Bragg one for three. Hits this one out in the left field. Curtis comes on and makes a nice catch. Two outs. Well, Graham Lloyd has not fooled anybody. A line drive Soho. Uh, caught off the bat of uh, Darren Lewis and Number Darren Bragg get a line drive that uh, Chad Curtis comes in and makes a knee-high grab. Nice play by Curtis. Tell you, that and young man does a good job out there. Yeah. Mo Vaughn steps in. And Mo says what ought to do a left field. Curtis Waves off Bernie Williams, so Graham Lloyd and the Yankees, an easy inning here the eighth. We played eight, 11, three games. And the Yankees are enjoying the early season ride that they are on, coming into this game with a record of 31 and 10. They have 11 to three lead here in the top of the ninth inning, and Jeter faces Steve Avery. You know, we talked about Avery when he was warming up, TJ, but what happens to a young man like this? I mean, why does he go from the top to the bottom in such a big hurry? Well, like I said, he, he was injured, and then he changed his motion, and then while he was pitching, while he was injured, he just was getting tattooed, and then he lost confidence. And, and now I, you've got to start back from the start. You've got to start on the motion, and then the last to come is confidence. Well, hit in the gap, left center field, moving over is Lewis, and what a play he made. Boy, did he cover some ground. Very, very, very good play, and that ball, that play was made, but the ball being held up by the wind. And when you, when the ball went out, you had no chance, and then it just, uh, Darren Lewis, his speed got him right over to that corner. And one of the reasons the Red Sox are a better club in 98 is because of the speed of Darren Lewis and the play of Bragg in right field and O'Leary in left. 
Paul O'Neill hits it hard, but Benjamin is there to throw him out, so two gone here to toss the ninth. I've always felt this infield at Fenway Park was extremely fast. They talk about grass infields. This infield is bluegrass, but it's cut relatively short, and the ball just skids off that short bluegrass. And, and sometimes you can get balls that, that that ball that um, O'Neill hit, it hit and then it really skidded and took off. And it forces the infielders to have play with soft hands. Or bruises, one of the two, if you don't have soft hands. Williams takes one up high. That's what was wrong with me at shortstop. My hands were soft. <laughs> That's right. Bobby Mercer came up as a shortstop. Hideki Arab, who says, I want out there at shortstop, too. Arabu awaits his start in Chicago. It'll be David Cohn and Brett Saberhagen pitching the finale of this three-game series tomorrow afternoon. A big good game. A couple of ex-teammates with Kansas City Royals. Brett Saberhagen uh, making a comeback. This is about his third comeback, isn't it? From surgery, shoulder, elbow, all those things. Ball four to Bernie with two outs. David Cohn making a comeback too after surgery two on surgery. His, yeah. Well, he struggled a little bit in his last outing. You know, he's got a good record, but he has very uncone like uh, other statistics. 6.60 ERA. Strawberry takes the curveball on the outside corner for a called strike. He's two for four with an RBI double. And even with the left-hander out there, they put the shift on Strawberry. They put the shift on Strawberry that today, and it's a two for four day for him so far with an RBI. That uh, gets away from Veritek, and Williams will move the second. That was a curveball wild pitch that hit off Veritek's glove and caromed up on top of the screen. Anytime the ball goes out of play like that off the, off the pitching mound, it's a one base. Two and two. You know, Avery is only 27. He'll be 28. Well, he's 28 now. He, he turned 28 April 14. But th that's still young. My heavens, it's young. The baby. <laughs> and he's left-handed. And he's uh, done it before. When he was 21 years old, he was 18 and 8 with the Atlanta Braves in 1991. If these guys get tired of him, I would make you a bet that Leo Mazzoni would take him back and get him uh, pitching uh, relatively well again. Well hit deep to right center field. Lewis won't catch up with this one. One hops the bullpen, and Daryl Strawberry, shift or no shift, has three hits and two RBIs, and the Yankees lead it 12 to 3. A little cut fastball or the stayed on the inside part of the plate about belt high and Daryl just leveled off on it and he said shift this and he shifted all right shifted into high gear <laughs> you can shift but I tell you what you can't shift that far and going in to run for strawberry Homer Bush Got two outs here in the ninth 
We don't call those high fives anymore, but I guess that's just a uh, best. I don't know what they call that. Tell you the truth, Jorge Posada swings and misses. I guess it's still a high five, somewhat of a high five. A closed high five. The other one is an open high five. That's a closed high five. No balls, two strikes to Posada. Aaron Seabe had his problems here. He finally moves on to Texas and is doing Very wonders well. down there. Six swing, one hopper back to Avery. Yankees are gone here in the ninth inning, but they do pick up another run, and they've left a runner on base in every inning. They lead it 12 to 3. Bottom of the ninth. Yankees in front, 12-3. Now it's time to take a look at our GM turning point of the game. And it comes in the second inning. Base is loaded. Chuck Knobloch gets deep to right field. Way back, and it's a grand slam for Chuck Knobloch. The Yankees score five in that inning. And Knobloch enjoys that trot around the bases on the grand slam. So another pitching change. Mr. Nelson will come in, take over for Lloyd. Graham Lloyd serving his suspension. Get her getting ready to Jeff Nelson getting ready to serve his. And Joe Torrey, this is a good game for uh, the Yankees to have right before the, these two guys have to go on the shelf. And plus, Nelson uh, did had a little shaky uh, outing last night, getting back out there on the mound and uh, get some confidence in him. A lot of hits per innings, though. And he's a better pitcher than that. He has better stuff than 28 hits in 22 and two-thirds innings. Of course, they will not uh, serve their suspensions at the same time. Uh, as soon as Strawberry has served his, uh, Graham Lloyd will begin to serve his suspension. Keith Johns will be uh, the hitter, batting for Leritz. And the first pitch to Johns is up high. He was just called up today and takes over uh, the place of Trot Nixon, who is on the roster. So just up from uh, Pawtucket. It's one thing about the Red Sox. When they go to make a uh, move uh, to send the player down to Lowell or send the player down to Pawtucket, it's only an hour drive to Pawtucket, hour and a half. And a pretty good curveball that Johnson's got to face. Now it's uh, one and two. <laughs> they didn't. They didn't throw like this in the International League, Coach. <laughs> and another breaking ball outside. Now it's two and two. Numbers at Triple-A for Keith Johns. That's after about 35 games. And another foul back just to the right of us here. John Sterling, Michael Kay, they seem to be all right. Three balls, two strikes to Johns leading off here at the top of the uh, check that the bottom of the ninth inning. Yankees in front. By nine, 12 to three. Ball four, the leadoff batter is on. Jeff Nelson, when, when he gets in trouble, he has trouble throwing his fastball for strikes. Now that's, that's unusual. And I'm sure Mel Stottlemyre and uh, Joe Torrey are trying to figure out what they can do to get him to throw his fastball for strikes because the fastball tails in on the right-handed hitter so well that it sets up the breaking ball, but he gets to where he can throw his breaking ball over the plate and can't throw his fastball.
Now he's falling behind O'Leary. Two balls and no strikes. two and one and all you got to do is throw it someplace within six inches on either side of the corner of home plate the home plate 17 inches wide so you've got a a 29 inch strike zone throw it over there and Mr. Hirschbeck will give you a benefit of the doubt and that's out of play now it's a two and two See the shadows now beginning to creep along the uh, home plate area. Swing and a miss at a high fastball, well out of the strike zone. One gone here tonight. A high fastball that uh, looked like it was a four seamer because usually Nelson's ball tails back, and that ball just kind of cut right in there and stayed straight. John Valentin hit a two-run home run back in the fourth inning. Bobby pitching and throwing strikes is nothing more than confidence. You see pitchers out there with all kinds of motions from Louis Tiant to Marichelle to Warren Spahn. Line sharply down the left field line. It will be in. A double. They will hold Johns up at third. And now runners at second and third and only one out for Boston. And Nelson threw that sinker in and it really wasn't a sinker. It was a tailing fastball that stayed out on the plate. And Valentin got his hands inside and put the barrel of the bat on the ball. Benjamin now one for three. John Valentin's a pretty good hitter, Bobby. Yes, he is. You know, and you, you kind of lose sight of him in there when you've got Garcia Parra and you've got Nairing and Mo Vaughn and all those guys be, you know, and he, he just kind of falls in there and you just say, oh, yeah, and you look up and he's put some good numbers up. Benjamin playing in place of Garcia Parra. Benjamin is a, uh, he's a, he's an aggressive hitter. He likes it if it's around the strike zone. That's what Jim Rice wants those guys. If the ball looks good at home plate, go to swinging. You can't hit the ball unless you get the bat off your shoulder, and Jim Ed could hit. I told him, I said, you know, if you had all the weight programs that these guys have now, think how you would have hit. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't need a weight program. <laughs> he was as strong as they come. <laughs> Still is. Not many flies floating around the ballpark, but there are a few around third base, nothing around second. Why is that? Well, you saw John. He was looked like he was batting some flies away. 20 minutes, 40 minutes from now, Godzilla Thon will start. As John strikes out. Number 47. Another high fastball, and Jeff Nelson just blew that ball right on by Mike Benjamin. Again, that was not his sinker, the, the ball that he throws with the two seams. That was more of a four-seam fastball that just stayed straight. Two gone, two men out. This is Jason Veritek. Last hope for Boston. High and outside for a ball.
I think the, the, the hardest time for a pitcher is when he's out there knowing that the game is out of hand and you're trying to throw strikes the best you can. <laughs> and you can't find the zone. It is because the adrenaline isn't there and it's it's more like a practice game or a spring training game and then you're trying to throw strikes and it doesn't happen. And now he's in front. One ball, two strikes to Veritek. And your and your thought process is, oh no, it's not going to start again. Oh no, please, God, just let me throw the ball over the plate and just let him pop the ball up the plate. But we please. all know you can't wish your way. You in cannot a wish zone. it. No, you can't. You got to throw it. You got to rear back and throw it. The minute you start aiming the ball, one, you can't throw strikes. Two, if you do throw strikes, the ball doesn't have anything on it. Right. And the incentive here is uh, if he can get Veritek out, he saves a couple of runs. That helps the earn run average. Wow. Foul ball off the left side. Most of the uh, 33,120 have left Fenway. Official sellout here for the second game of the three-game series. Back up the middle. And this should do it, and it does. As Nelson throws over to Swain and the Yankees. Even it up in this three-game series by winning today's game 12-3. And a blowout at Fenway. David Wells started the game looking for his sixth victory. And he will pick up his sixth consecutive victory in a row. We'll be back with a wrap-up as the Yankees win it by the score of 12-3. Stay with us.